All right. I think you want to remain standing. We're going to read the scripture in a minute. I just want to mention one other thing. I, I think extending your influence is about being a Christian, but not just at church. And when people work hard to extend themselves into the lives of others, and they accomplish good things, that is notable and it ought to be recognized. Greg Ripley has been named as the scoutmaster. Uh, Greg, t tell me exactly so I don't drag it out. Okay. Now, that's important. Scouts is important. You all know how I feel about that. But, Greg, thank you for your service to the boys. That's a wonderful thing. And if you get a chance to let Daniel bend your ear, Daniel went on a class trip to Washington, D.C. and New York, and I can only imagine he's got some good stories to tell. All right. This is from Matthew chapter 9. We're just continuing right on through. We're skipping a few things, but we're going to go through everything that I think is really good for the life of the church. So, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now, if that was all we read, do you think this was a popular man? No. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Isn't that funny that even the scripture makes that distinction that there are sinners and then there are disreputable ones? <laughs> but when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Those were the religious leaders. Don't you suppose their churches were popular? Those people are scum. When Jesus heard that, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who are sinners. And let's pray. Lord, I just love these stories. And I hope always that my passion bleeds into the hearts of others. Pray that I could be an encouragement and that people could feel lifted up and, and value the potential of their lives every day. May we be a hopeful people and full of joy. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, Matthew was a tax collector, and we already know what everybody thinks about tax collectors. Typically, they were dishonest. Typically, they were hated by the people. When they collected taxes, they got to set the rate. Rome insisted on a certain amount from each person, and the tax collector, who could make your life absolutely miserable, can you imagine that concept? The tax collector, who could make your life absolutely miserable, got to add on whatever surcharge he wanted, and he got to keep the difference. So typically, they were hated. Now, we, we don't know if Matthew was dishonest or if he was hated. We just don't know. Um, typically, when you hear the story told, you hear that he is dishonest and he is hated, but that's an addition that we're not sure about. So we do know that Matthew ran with a rough crowd and that he cared about them. When he had dinner at his house, he invited some reputable sinners and some disreputable ones. Wow, sounds like my kind of gathering. You know, it's easy in our culture to make people guilty by association. And it makes people jump to conclusions that may not be fair. You know, I didn't think of this as a blessing as a child, and I wouldn't wish it for your children. But I grew up in taverns. My Stepdad that raised me had a tavern, my grandfather had a tavern, and my uncle had two taverns. So the first thing I learned about taverns was that if you were a cute little kid and you went in and talked nice to the people, you could get quarters 
and you could get nuts, and you could get sandwiches, and you could get pop, and they'd all treat you real good. I feel a little guilty. What can I say? But the truth is I learned more than that. I learned that sometimes in a rough crowd it can be a little scary. I saw people who had ruined their lives. I saw people have their wives come in and pull them off stools. Um, I saw a lot of things that scared me. But the thing that I didn't anticipate that I came to understand and that I believe with all my heart was that in that place, even among those handful that were disreputable sinners, I found good people. I found people who had a good heart. And I've found that in any culture you want to identify, even if it's a culture you're uncomfortable with, there's good people there. Now, first of all, there's people that God loves, and they're important. But there's also good people. And here was Matthew. He had decided to follow Jesus, and his first instinct was, hey, I care for those other people. I want them to meet Jesus too. So when, when you see the person who looks different than you, you know, culturally things are just different. When I was a boy, a tattoo was a little unusual. The things they put in their ears, not earrings, what do you call those circles? What? Gauges. They put gauges in their ears. Now, I'd be afraid somebody would grab that and pull it myself, but people wear them. Be careful what kind of judgments you make. If you look at people other than with the judgment that <laughs> Jesus loves them, you may be undermining their ability to come to the Lord. You may be undermining a ministry opportunity that God is giving you. People are valuable because they're people not because they are like us, not because they fit. When, remember when I came to the church, some of you that were here, I said, now remember, if I come here, we're going to get some folks that are messy. Anybody remember that I used that word? I said, we're going to get some people who maybe don't fit. We're going to get some people who are needy. And I went out and made a list of some of the needy people that might come to our church and you know what, it's been a real blessing to me because we've had people from a lot of those groups come to our church and some of us, some of them are part of our family. And of all the things that speak well of our church, that's one of the very best things because everybody's welcome here. And I have confidence that whoever walks in the door, you're going to welcome them and you're going to do what you can to make them feel at home. I think that reflects the heart of God. As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith to him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Now that is a remarkable statement. Here is a man with means. Here is a man with position, probably secure for life. And Jesus says, Follow me, and he says, Sure, no problem. I'll go with you. Where do you live, Jesus? Oh, I don't have a place for my head. Well, I have fun in this. We'll just work it out as it goes along. Uh, well, what, when do we have days off? Uh, Saturday. Boy, people are going to love us, aren't they? No. And off he goes. We can only speculate as to why Matthew followed Jesus. Maybe he didn't like his life. Maybe he was fed up. Maybe he was hated. Maybe he felt guilty. Maybe he was a cheat. We just don't know. But maybe he said enough is enough. Here's this guy I've been hearing about. I've been seeing all these miracles. I'm going with him. Well, that would be a good decision, wouldn't it? Maybe it was a parade of changed people whose circumstances didn't improve, but they treated him differently. Can you imagine the constant grumbling this tax collector would have experienced? And now Jesus is walking around the countryside, healing people, making people converted, and challenging them to be different people.
people. They still had to pay their taxes. Their lives didn't improve dramatically in a, in a financial sense, and their physical circumstances didn't change. But if they were following Jesus, probably their hearts did. And maybe he saw that, and maybe it affected him. And that's important for all of us to realize. Often it is the change that God brings in our lives that people see and appreciate. If there is no change in your life because you trust Jesus, you probably need to get more serious about following him because he asks change of us and all of it's positive and all of it's good and in spite of the people who would like to tell you Christians are wacky, God isn't going to ask you to do anything wacky. Maybe it was his previous teaching. As a Jewish boy, he would have grown up hearing God's word. He would have been taught that there were moral principles in play, and he may have been taught that there was a Messiah, and maybe he looked and said, hmm, that's the Messiah. Maybe this numbers guy just did the math. We all use that phrase in one form or another, or we say to somebody, just do the math. Just figure it out. Just decide what makes sense. You know, I really don't want people to believe me just because I say so. I don't want people to respond to what I ask them to do in church just because I say so. I don't believe growth happens that way. I think cults happen that way. I want people to follow the Lord because it's sensible, it's orderly, it makes sense. And because we're trying to do the right thing together. And that can be a slower decision-making process for some people. But it's an important decision-making process. I don't think personal growth spiritually really happens unless you're making decisions. Oh, I want to do that because God wants me to. I want to do that because it's the right thing, not just because I'm going to go along. You can go to some churches where everybody wears the same haircut. Everybody wears the same styles. Everybody says the same things. You know what? That's too homogenous. You've got to decide on your own, not just conform. Conformity does not make spirituality. Only the decisions and the giving of the heart make spirituality. So maybe Matthew just said, you know, this all makes sense to me. I'm seeing all this. It's tremendous. This guy wants me to follow him. I'm going to go. I hope that's your decision. And maybe you're getting there in small increments. You know what? Going forward is better than not moving. And going forward is better than going back. And realize that if you're a struggling Christian and you're trying to go forward, God values that. But think about this first. Jesus wanted Matthew. You say, oh, I just don't know if God wants me and I just don't know if my life's very useful to God. Well, you know what? He wants you and your life and your influence are valuable to him. Now, why does Matthew listen and so many others don't? Because Jesus was really calling everyone to follow him. He's calling us to follow him. And even in our group, which is a good group, we have people who are just reluctant, just stubborn, sometimes just putting in their time to please somebody else, and then they fall off. Why does Matthew listen and others do not? Well, let me speculate. First thing is that Jewish people were constantly exposed to a couple of different truths. They were it was exposure that God wanted them to have, okay? Why did God want them to have repetition? What's repetition for in the Bible? Emphasis, okay? And they would consider these two things day after day and year after year and generation after generation. The first one was they were taught from the time of Abraham to expect that they would prosper in their efforts and be blessed. They were taught even as children to expect that because they were God's people, they were going to change the world. They were going to do things of, of, of uh, accomplishment. They were going to be people of influence. And you know what? One of the reasons people claim they don't like Jews today, which is gross racism, by the way, um, is because they accomplish. Oh, you know, they're all the bankers. They have the money. Oh, you know, they control this. They control that. One of the reasons they do is because they approach life expecting to accomplish 
their children are taught that they're expected to accomplish. <laughs> Our kids laugh now. Even when they were young and old enough to understand and not feel threatened, we used to say, now, you know, you're this age, and when you get this age, we're going to turn your room into something else. Now, you can go to college and we'll leave your room alone. But when you come back from college, you can sleep in your room. But when you graduate from college, you're going to get a job and you're going to take care of yourself because that's God's order. And you're going to do something that will pay your bills and make your way. And we're going to turn your room into something else. And it was just amazing how we were able to find stuff to do with those two rooms. And today, they accomplish. It was expected. It was cultural. It wasn't, oh, daddy will take care of you if you can't find a, find a boss who likes you. I had a conversation with somebody this last week. I think I'm going to quit. Well, don't quit unless you've got a job in hand. Well, that makes sense. Next day, they quit. No job. Well, I might get a job here. Okay. Not a good habit, folks. But they expected to prosper in their efforts and be blessed, and they were. Now, if you live with the conviction that your efforts will be blessed, then you're more likely to make a greater effort. We had a little boy in our church. Couldn't throw a baseball straight. This was in another church. Couldn't throw a baseball straight. Dad wasn't good with a baseball and I don't think was too interested, but it bothered the little boy that he couldn't throw a baseball straight. I said to him one day, you want to play catch? No. Well, why not? Don't like it. I said, if I could teach you how to throw the ball straight, would you like it? Fifteen minutes. He could throw the ball straight. Because throwing a ball is all mechanics. Once he learned to point his arm in the right direction and have follow through in the right direction, the ball would go basically where he wanted it to go. And all of a sudden it was a whole new world. You want to play catch? Oh yeah. What's the difference? He expected to succeed. Almost everything in life is mechanical. You follow the right process, you come to the right place. When I sold life insurance, they tell you, if you want to make money, here's how you do it. You make 100 contacts, you get three good, good appointments. You get three good appointments, you make one sale now and maybe one sale later. And then you've got to make another 100 contacts. Now you could sit and wish all day long that it was going to work for you. But you know who the most successful person in the office was? He was big. He was homely. He was unkept. He was untidy, and he was rude. But you know what? He was constantly making those phone calls. Because it was about the math, not about the great talent. Talent's way overrated, folks. It's way overrated. It's doing the right thing and expecting blessing from doing the right thing. Those who don't make a great effort lose hope. They give up and then they don't enjoy the benefits of accomplishing. Second thing, they were challenged to listen. Here's Matthew. Jesus comes along and says, follow me. Matthew says, sure. He listened. In our culture today, we notice that people listen to respond and to argue, not to take in. Some people don't hear you because they're so busy forming a comeback that they can't hear you. And you see repeatedly in the New Testament that Jesus said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. So that's what we're talking about. Here comes dinner. Who does he invite? Came to pass and sat down at the table. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. What a mixed crowd. You suppose the religious folks were uncomfortable? Might have been. But Jesus and Matthew looked at those people with flaws. I'm sorry. Jesus looked at those people with flaws and knew in himself they have no secrets from him. Okay? 
Some people pride themselves on the ability to be an analyst and a critic. Oh, you know, they shouldn't do that. Well, you know what? Nobody has a greater insight into the faults of others than Jesus. He has complete knowledge. So, oops, that means he has complete knowledge of me. So, Jesus' approach was to value those people. Jesus' approach was to love those people. That's a hard lesson to learn because we value being critics and we value being irritable. The whole issue of how Jesus behaved should make us think. Let me ask you some questions. Do you think Jesus was number one, or I'm sorry, do you think he was joyful when he was with these people? Okay. Do you think he was laughing? It's a party. Do you think Jesus was laughing? Do you think Jesus was humorous? Now I'm convinced beyond all words that I think Jesus was probably a tremendous joke teller, liked to play practical jokes, and had fun with people. I'd even say that I think he was mischievous at times. It's possible to be serious about what's true and to have fun with people all at the same time, and that's engaging and attractive to people. Not to everybody, though. Do you think Jesus was A, clever or insightful, or B, degrading, insulting, and vulgar? A. Who do we aspire to be like most? Jesus. Okay. So should we be A or should we be B? Not as easy as it sounds, is it? Do you think they enjoyed his company? Yes. Do you think when Jesus talked with them that he was focused on himself or others? Right. I mean... Think of how the guy could dominate a conversation. Somebody could say, yeah, you know, I helped build that house. Jesus could say, yeah, well, I created the planet. Yeah, well, Jesus, I, I really love my family. Well, I love the world so much I'm going to die for everybody. I mean, the one-upsmanship could have been endless. It could have been repelling. But Jesus is with these people and you have every sense that they like it. Now, surprise, surprise, there were critics. Okay? Because they had analyzed the way people behave. And Jesus pushed the envelope with them. But they saw the sinners as sinners and not themselves. They didn't see themselves as needy. Now, folks, let's be clear. All we have in this room are sinners. I don't know that we have any disreputable ones. But we have sinners. And that puts us all in need of a Savior and all in need of being respectful to the other sinners because we share a common problem. But they did not listen, many of them. We don't know their stories, but we've watched life. Many people here, they take in the sounds but they don't respond. He said when, Jesus said when he heard them that uh, they that are healthy don't need a physician, but they that are sick. How, would you, how many have ever gone to the ER? How many have you ever gone to the ER and it was urgent? Okay. One of the most recent ones in my, in my mind is Greg. <laughs> he was so sick, I was concerned about his well-being. I was concerned about the future. Had he waited longer, we could have lost him. <laughs> I can't tell you what that would have done to me, and, I, and I'm not his mom, and I'm not his wife, 
and I'm not one of his kids, but you know what? That's awful. What if the doctor would have said, I don't want to see you because you're sick? How many of you are okay with that? How many of you are not okay with that? Okay. Here's the lesson. When we get around people and we see that they're sinners, and we say, oh, I don't want to be around them. They're sick. Jesus said, but they're the ones that need what you have. In church one morning, a lady named Gwen was about to start her four-year-old Sunday school class. When a little boy showed up, he didn't have any identification. None of the other children knew who he was. She didn't know, she didn't know how to register him or how to contact a parent if there was a need. And uh, she managed to get the little boy's first name, but she couldn't get his last name, so she just couldn't identify him. Nobody that she talked to seemed to be able to identify the boy. His name was Brian. She said, Brian, what's your daddy's name? And he said, Daddy. Now, four years old, that's a smart answer. That's not a dumb kid. That's just what he knows. So she tried again. Brian, what's your mommy's name? Mommy, he answered. So she thinks and suddenly she realizes there's a way to get the answer I need. So she says, Brian, what did your daddy call your mommy? His face lit up and with a grin and a deep voice, he replied, hey, babe. <laughs> now that's really laughable because it's a child. But the truth is, we have the opportunity to listen when God speaks, and we could give a clever answer, and we can give a clever answer that other people might laugh at. You know, well, I don't want to go to church. I'm going to be in hell with all my friends. Ha 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 ha! Oh, that's a smart one, isn't it? I mean, you could just go on and on and on with the clever responses and the clever reasons why people don't follow God. But we don't talk about them when we come to church. We talk about Matthew because when the Lord called, Matthew said, I'm listening, let's go. It's going to be hard, let's go. My gifts are limited, guess what? His gifts turned out to be greater than what he thought because the potential we have as we serve God is greater than what we understand our potential to be. He didn't see himself as a teacher. He became one. He didn't see himself as a witness. He became one. He didn't see himself as a great leader. He became one. God still uses Matthews. Will you be a Matthew? The health of the church, the future of the church, depends on people who hear God speak and respond, not those who hear and applaud. Not those who hear and hope somebody else responds. The same is true in everything we choose to involve ourselves with that's truly valuable. Greg's going to be scoutmaster. He could sit around and wait for people to give him credit. He could sit around and wait for people to applaud. I know him well enough to know he won't do that. So, that's Matthew. What kind of guy was he before Jesus called? None of us are sure. What kind of person are you? We all have a facade. Nobody's for sure. But the question is, what are you going to do when he calls? Not what's the other person going to do. What are you going to do? And that is the opportunity that stands in front of us day by day as we remind ourselves that the world around us will be blessed if we will be the blessing we're supposed to be. And if we remind ourselves that God wants us to hear when He speaks, and that means do something. So what a great opportunity. What a great life this Christian life is. 
God says, help me do this. It's really important. It has eternal consequences. And oh, by the way, the pay is beyond your imagination. So do the math. Be like Matthew. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful to be one of your servants among many. And I pray that as I grow in the Lord, that would bless others. And that it would encourage others to also say, I will be a Matthew, I will step out, and I will follow the Lord. May we be known as a church of great passion and great diligence. May we accomplish great things for you in this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now don't forget Coffee Fellowship. Um, there, the, um, save your napkin so you can find out if you're a winner. And um, don't forget the shower next week. Folks, if, if the church is truly going to be the family we want it to be and be knitted together, it's important to attend these kind of things, even if you can just make an appearance. There is a group gift um, that Mary's already purchased. If you'd like to help with the group gift, please see Mary. God bless you all. Please join us for Coffee Fellowship.